Hello and welcome to the Defiance Open Metaverse Show. I am very excited to be joined by Justin Bannon, co-founder of Boson Protocol today. Justin, welcome to the show. I think the first thing we should do is get like, what is Boson Protocol? What is it all about? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Robin. It's great to be here. Um, so Boson Protocol um, answers the question, is it possible in Web3 to do kind of e-commerce or have physical commerce without the need for an intermediary, without the need to trust an Amazon and Alibaba, without the need to trust a seller? Um, and that's sort of like a really important um, uh, question because, you know, for all this, if we've got Web3, decentralized, trustless systems, if in order to do like the number one economic activity, which is commerce, you still need Amazon, you still need Alibaba, you still need, you know, trusted entities, then that's a really big constraint on the size of the Web3 economy. Are we are we looking to disrupt Amazon or is it something more like Shopify at this well, stage? Well, what we're looking, the aim of Boson Protocol is to become a layer in the same way as IPFS is like a layer for file storage, um, is, is to become a, a layer in Web3 that we just plug into to, to do um, commercial exchange. So if I need to, if I need to share, uh, you know, if, if I need to go and, transfer some data or access some data across the web, I use TCP IP. I mean, we don't need to, the, the, there's no need for sort of intermediaries and librarians and any of those, they've all been kind of disintermediated. And the same way with Boson Protocol, it's designed to be able to tokenize, you know, the world's physical things, products, services, every, and, and digital things, everything, tokenize them in a standard board app format, uh, a redeemable NFT format, and then make the exchange between those things as trustless and low friction and low cost as possible. I mean, that's the hub, isn't it? The 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 trustless bit, I think we kind of get, but the low friction part has traditionally been horrific. Like anytime you go, oh, we're going to do it the blockchain web three way, everyone goes, oh, no, oh, no, really? And I, I've proposed a few different things to to various VCs, and they went, "Yeah, but why would you add all that friction? It's just it's just a no go." So it sounds like you've you've got the answer, I've got the solution, but and how does it work exactly? How do how do you enable that? Okay, so I mean the 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 basic sort of exchange mechanism of of, of Boson Protocol. Um, I mean, we've got V1 Live, which is an exchange mechanism, which I designed with my co-founder. And, you know, we run like Metaverse Fashion Week and had brands like Tommy Hilfiger and stuff doing loads of commerce on it. But it's, it, we're about to launch V2, which has been completely redesigned um, by some of the, you know, the world's top blockchain minds. So the protocol design itself was designed by a guy called Aditya that um, works for Ethereum Foundation, designing Ethereum 2 and did a whole load of academic work on these type of exchange methods. Um, so essentially what happens is a seller will offer, a seller has something to sell. Let's say we've got a bicycle. That seller will place an offer um, uh, within, will create an offer within Boson Protocol. And then a buyer um, can see that offer, can see the terms of that offer. And if they like it, the buyer can commit some funds to the smart contract. So, um, at that point, the buyer receives what we call a redeemable NFT. So now the, the, the protocol has got some buyer funds locked up and the buyer has a redeemable NFT, which is like a futures contract. It's a claim on a physical asset. It's not actually tokenizing the physical asset. It's like an incentivized IOU because within that smart contract, you've got right the payment amount for the item, but there's also optionally a buyer deposit, which is a bit like, you know, uh, non-refundable deposit for a restaurant booking gives the seller confidence that the buyer is not going to reverse and back out. And then optionally, there's also a seller deposit. So if you were buying something from Nike, you probably wouldn't need them to put a deposit. You trust they're going to deliver. But if you're buying something from some random on the internet, well, the protocol is going to make sure either you get the item or your money back, but you could still have your funds locked up um, and, and uh, you know, kind of have time wasters so you've got these kind of deposits and a payment amount all locked up in a smart contract and then the buyer gets this redeemable um 
uh, NFT. Um, at this point, yeah, sure, the buyer could just redeem um, and we, we can go through that. But now you've got an NFT with a, a kind of credible claim on a physical asset. So actually what you can do now with that NFT is you can, you know, you can trade it. So you can go and trade that on OpenSea. Um, you know, you could, you could flip it, do whatever you want with it. You could use it as collateral in sort of some nifty fi um, You can transfer it. So we're doing a whole load of like this huge social Christmas gifting where, you know, we've got a nephew that likes these rare sneakers this Christmas can go and buy a tokenized sneaker and and send it to him he lives in los angeles you live in london you know pretty pretty cool thing he can then redeem it or flip it um and so all you all you can hold it so we're doing we've got quite a few of these kind of luxury wine and spirits um kind of uh companies that are like it takes 12 years for some of this rare whiskey to mature right tokenize it and these things trade like futures contracts for years you know they're like commoditizing everything so, you know, what it does is this bridge between physical and digital, but and plugs into like DeFi and, and, and Nifty Fi. So anyway, the buyer has now this um, redeemable NFT. And eventually when a buyer receives it and they want to redeem, they hit redeem. And then what happens is there's a period to dispute. If nothing happens, the seller gets paid. It's an optimistic protocol, right? That's what makes it so efficient, so clean, the, the happy path has very, very little obstruction. However, during that period, if the buyer is not happy, then they can dispute. And the dispute goes through two phases. The first phase is a piece of game theory called mutual resolution. It's been designed by one of the world's top game theorists, one of the world's top behavior ec economists. And it's really designed to kind of, you know, handle 80, 90% of the, of, of, of the disputes in an automated way. But if that fails, then what happens is the buyer can then further escalate to independent dispute resolvers. And depending on the, you know, this is set up as part of the offer, but that those dispute resolvers can go from being Pleros and fully decentralized, which is nice, fully decentralized, very secure, but quite expensive, all the way, you know, to, down to just being like, I don't know, um, a trusted retailer or a trusted call center. Um, but the key here is that, um, unlike with the sort of Amazon and eBay models, these dispute resolvers play a commoditized role. They're not sitting in the middle of the platform controlling and eating, you know, the whole industry. They are literally a service provider. And so that's a sort of, yeah, uh, high level overview um, of, of the protocol. It's also got, you know, some really other, really interesting other features, but that's the core exchange mechanism. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it all makes sense. The once a thing is turned into a digital version of itself, it's very swift and very free and very liquid. But I'm I'm curious how how expensive it is to commit it in the first place. Um, really expensive. It costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it on Ethereum, which is why we're launching V2 on Polygon. Which is yeah, I was going to say yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, um, what, what, how much logic has to go into that smart contract? Because I imagine it has to be very kind of airtight. Well, this is, I mean, this is why having the world's top, you know, protocol designer, like someone from Ethereum Foundation, and then we've got, you know, our, our tech lead is one, is, 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 is a guy called Cliff Hall, that's who's like written um, NFT sort of ERT, uh, ERC standards and stuff. Because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to make, it game theoretically, you know, kind of um, incentive compatible and blockchain efficient. Um, and that's, you know, that intersection is what what makes, you know, the difference between a really effective protocol and something that's like kind of unworkable. Um, and we've, you know, we've got really clean. Uh, I mean, we're super happy with it. I mean, one of our Probably the person I look up to almost most in blockchain is Trent McConaughey from Ocean, uh, sort of founder of Token Engineering, our first angel investor. And he's sort of like reviewed it all and is like, wow, this is this, this will be like in textbooks moving forward as an example of protocol design. So, yeah, we're super happy with I mean, it's all about getting the best people 
working on a hard problem and let the magic happen. And we're, we're just super happy to be releasing this thing. Um, and of course, it's all fully open source. So hopefully uh, there'll be lots of kind of learnings and components that, that will find them, themselves into other protocols as we advance this, this thing we build together called Web3. And of course, NFTs are 100% responsible for the planet burning down. They probably started mm -hmm. the war in Ukraine. NFTs are just completely toxic. It, it, are you having to struggle to educate people or, or sell this to skeptics or people who think crypto is a scam? I'm just wondering what the kind of sentiment that's coming back to you is at this point um, in the market. Well, no, I mean, not at all, really. I mean, I mean, I we launched this during crypto winter where all VCs were saying, come on, Justin, you're a professional guy. You've got a family. What are you wasting your time for? I mean, Web3 is dead. Um, and, we, and, we, and V1, do, right? Do, do, you, do you mean 2018, 19? Yeah. That, that, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that was bleak. I remember. Yeah. 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 Um, but I just, I, 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 I studied innovation. I knew that they'd said the web was dead twice, right? Um, and I just knew we had something that was a major part of Web3 if Web3 happened. Um, but so I spent, you know, the first kind of year explaining to people Web3 was going to happen. The second year explained to people if Web3 is going to happen, you're going to need decentralized commerce. Otherwise, it's like Web3 plugged into Amazon. You know, that doesn't work. Um, but over the last like five or six months, I mean, it's just gone crazy because suddenly everyone gets that you need web3 commerce and we've got major brands we've got you know loads of nft projects we've got loads of integrators everybody gets it I and mean, it's like it's amazing how this thing flips i mean shopify have done a whole load of stuff on token gating and stuff which is almost like the facebook meta announcement it's like suddenly everybody wants it of course we've got i mean we're fully programmable we we have to, like full token gating we've had that since version one um, with like super advanced, which is it's just completely programmable, um, like, you know, how, what you can enable. Um, so it's commerce and it's loyalty. Um, so no, I mean, to answer to your question, we, you know, the market understands, you know, that and wants Web3 commerce now. So we, we're just trying to run as fast as we can to get product into the hands of people that want it and help, yeah. help, help builders build with, with Boson. Yeah, and, and like when you're talking about it, the cost of a hundred thousand dollars to to initiate a smart contract, is that per item or is that can you create bundles of items so you can collect you can create maybe Oh well that uh, that was um we did whole of Metaverse Fashion Week and we, we paid for all the transactions and it went really well and it was on Ethereum and it cost us a fortune. Yeah. Now it's on Polygon. A the protocol is probably twenty times more efficient. And it's on Polygon, which is, I don't know how many times more efficient they have told me, but basically the cost of it comes down to it's no longer a factor. I mean, we we deployed, we've deployed our sort of smart contracts onto like Testnet or, or you know, and, and I, I got a message pop up today and it was like $2, um, you know, so that it's like, it's no longer on my radar the cost of these of, of, well that's of, good of doing it which is which which is which is amazing so um yeah but i mean basically what you're saying is that anything that is physical can have yeah. a digital twin and that digital yeah. twin can go and do all the wonderful things that nfts can do and i think we are thanks to things like this hopefully going to get beyond the jpeg era because yeah. I love JPEGs. I mean, the JPEGs are really fun, but I mean, let's let's be real here. Like, what an NFT can be is so much more than that. I know you've probably got quite a lot to say about the NFT thing itself, but like, even just before we got on the stream, you were you were telling me like, like NFTs are just an exciting piece of technology that we've barely scratched the surface of what they're capable of. So I'm curious if you can give me some more insight into yeah. your thinking on that. Well, I think I don't think people understand. I mean, NFTs are things right and if you look around you everything is a thing and so everything you see everything every unique item you know every every non-unique collection by all of these things are things and nfts are the standard for representing things so you know whether it's a physical thing that's going to have this kind of you know redeemable nft 
it might have a digital you know a digital like we're doing loads with like fashion brands where they're creating sneakers where you buy the physical you get the digital you know and because the physical is sold as an nft and the digital is an nft they can be bundled within the protocol and and they're just treated exactly the same then you've got you know these financial instruments i mean boson is like a financial instrument that commoditizes physical products and stuff you know when they're nfts they flow around the whole you know they, they use all that nft infrastructure that you know i i think everything you see i mean all of the, if you think about the world, how everything's sort of represented by database transactions at the moment, right? These, you know, these things are going to be represented by NFTs that are just going to flow around an open system rather than be a database transaction locked in eBay or Netflix. Or, you know, if you've got the right to watch a movie, you'll have an NFT, which will just unlock it, right? If you've got, you know, the right to, you know, you've just bought yourself a new bicycle. You'll have an NFT that you can redeem for the bicycle. You won't have a database record hidden on eBay. Um, and, and all of these things will be released in a common interoperable standard. NFTs are things, smart, programmable things. And it's like, you know, I, I did my fireside with, with, with Trent the other day, and he was saying that blockchain's the rails upon which we're going to be rebuilding civilization. And NFTs are like the things... The transactions they are the primary objects of that of that new world so i guess yeah. you can say i'm pretty bullish on them yeah no i i have been since i first saw crypto kitties when i and as a filmmaker i was i was excited about nfts because i thought here was a way to for us to combat piracy here was a way to prove provenance make something that's better than piracy but of course that was again just a very basic understanding of what they are and how they can represent value and also how all the different ways that can be architected as well and i think one of the one of the hard things that we've seen this year is the the ability to circumvent royalties, which I thought was was harsh on the NFT space. But of course, if that goes away, then you have to innovate again and you have to figure out other ways to create some kind of recurring value to mm. the to the creator. Because I think if, if creators are better incentivized, they're gonna make better products. They'll probably be a lot more crap products, but actually, you know as always the cream rises to the top but it's it's so bizarre because what you're saying is that effectively everything that is great already can be great in a different way and have these superpowers attached yeah. to it yeah um and i think what what's hard for people to understand is that as you said this, these are like commodities and like futures contracts that feels very out of reach and alien and very wall street to a lot of people um so how do we market this how do we brand it? how do we get the communications right around this or do you even need to because actually the people who build on top of you are the ones that will do that work well it, it's it's you know we've just got a new sort of head of marketing and so we have lots of conversation about this it, you have to have audience specific messaging right so to crypto people you know explaining that these things are like futures contracts and stuff and all of that's you know in the DeFi world wow that's great but um, when we're working with higher, you know, uh, you know, more mainstream brands or more consumer facing, then I mean, my background is I, I run a big kind of billion dollar rewards program with digital vouchers. So we just say that these are like redeemable vouchers, right? This, you know, exactly the same. Like lots of loyalty programs are really complex underneath. But yeah, the, I was going to say it's kind of like a really gift card. Simple. It's yeah, not like a gift card, but it's just like but a representative it's a, claim. But it's on... a gift card for it's like a voucher or a coupon redeemable for a specific thing rather than yeah. like you know, and so and people get that, or it's like a blockchain IOU, right? Um, and so you've got to find the appropriate language and 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 sort of abstractions. Um and and that is I think where we are in the space at the moment, those bridges to web 2 which is where all of the the you know where all the customers are at the moment and the vast majority of people who are into crypto have never handled private keys right they, they've got centralized exchanges so you've got to have both the technology bridges bridges but also these kind of cognitive bridges where you're using words like yeah these are like nft vouchers if you've got one you can redeem it people get that right not i mean you, you not using language like you know algorithmic game theory futures contracts and all of that but for crypto audiences you know we we, we obviously love all that 
Yeah, I've got a question here from Power Alley. So if you get an NFT after a purchase, what happens to the NFT after the thing is delivered? And, is, and I guess on top of that, is there is there a, a a smart contract enforceable proof of delivery mechanism in there? At all? Okay, yeah. So there's, there's, there's two things there then. The first thing is after the purchase, the NFT is burned. Um, unless, you know, well, it, it's burned, but if you then want to resell the same item, you can create a new redeemable NFT, a new offer, which will then like chain the ID of the previous NFT so that you can see this, this kind of link of provenance. Um, the exception to the, this thing being burnt, though, is if, 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 if I go and buy this redeemable NFT and then you, Robin, before it's redeemed, buy it from me, you can buy it using the protocol. And then what that means is that your funds get locked up and it's it's this uh, as, as we call it perpetual royalties, and it's a solution to this problem of of people rooting around royalties because actually the protocol takes hold of the money and ensures it's it's actually cust custodied and sent back to the to the seller. So there's also some you know uh, okay you know, some great solutions gonna, there you, as well. You're gonna have to explain that to me again. How yeah. how is how is that perpetual royalties exactly? Well, at the moment, you mentioned there's the challenge with, you know, it's easy to get around royalties. Yeah. Um, but if you imagine that you've got an item that a seller puts on offer and the first buyer comes and says, OK, I'm going to put $500 in the smart contract and they get this redeemable NFT. Right. So there's now two options of how that buyer could sell that redeemable NFT. They could kind of just put it on OpenSea and sell it. And then it, it might leverage the standard, you know, kind of um, loyalty standard. But that can be rooted round, etc. But the other option is that they then sell it again through the protocol. And we call this a kind of like, you know, sequential sale. And so instead of outside of the protocol exchanging this NFT for the money, you would put your money into the protocol and then receive the NFT. So now your money is locked up as well. And then you might sell it again. The next person's money is locked up. So all the money is going into the protocol in the, in, as part of this exchange, and that then ensures that, that the, the original seller gets their royalties. Now, why would bet buyer one, two, three, four, five, six all put their money into the Lord, into the protocol and not do the exchange like using something like OpenSea? Well, the answer is it prevents any rug pull. That that the, there are you know OpenSea and stuff. When you've got physical items, it's possible if the if the original buyer buys something for five hundred dollars and then the final buyer gets it for like fifteen hundred, what happens is the seller doesn't deliver, right? Um, so there are incentives for these buyers to use the protocol to give them assurance that they'll either get the item or the money back. Um, so, so yeah, that's basically. I mean, the short answer is it's normally burned. But there, are, but where you've got things like perpetual royalties, that the, the NFT can live on and pass from hand from hand to hand. Um, yeah. And what was your what was your second question? What, yeah, I was just adding on to that. When is there a smart contract enforceable proof of delivery mechanism? So this quite this very deliberately is a, is configurable within the protocol. So when you create an offer you can set the evidence requirements for delivery. Uh, and so, you know, if you're set, if you're sending a book, we then it might be, okay, we will accept the UPS proof of proof of delivery. That that is like sufficient evidence of receipt. But if you were sending like a diamond ring, you might say, no, 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 we, we, we need like this pin needs to be entered into, you know, UPS do these kind of closed loop things. And if you were sending like a gold bar or something, right, then you might plug into, okay, there needs to be a cryptographic proof. There would be a signature would need to be. So basically, and also, you know, like things like NF NFC um, taps and all of that, we deliberately created the protocol to be unopinionated there. And, and as part of the offer, you prescribe and configure what is evidence of delivery and that's one of the things that the buyer accepts um you know as part as part of the offer we agree you know what is the evidence yeah so if i guess what the the, the ideal scenario for, for you is that there's a vibrant 
marketplace of people dipping in, selling, transferring, selling, but it all happens within Boson. Uh, do you need to build a, a front end, like an OpenSea style thing specifically for this? Because I think one of the problems I've seen with OpenSea is that it's just, it's impossible to find stuff on there. Yeah. And if it was sort of geared much more like eBay, for instance, where you had categories and verticals that you could kind of dip your toe into, then it might be easier to get what you actually yeah. wanted. Yeah, I mean, it's it, that's a really big strategic question, and our answer is, we've we are for V two of the protocol, which launches in 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 about a month. Um, we have a storefront like a DAP, which is um, a free to use storefront that anyone any seller can come and create and sell things um, on that uh, on that storefront. Um, however, we are a protocol, and we don't want to compete with our ecosystem so wherever possible we are you know we're, we're keeping the functionality of that pretty tight i mean and all of that code is open source for other people to use and then you know because we're getting lots of demand particularly from like these kind of mainstream brands that you know want to put more web 2.5 um front ends on and all of this and so what we're doing is working with an increasing number of integrators and 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 sort of dap uh builders so that we plug, help them plug Boson in, but they build it. Because, yeah, I mean, if we were to use our resources to create some sort of open C type thing, we would compete with our ecosystem and we'd end up being a, a vertically integrated stack, which is not what, what, what we're aiming to do. No, not at all. And so I, I, I guess my next question is, what are these brands? Can you, can you name any of them? Who, who's, well, who's jumping in? So we... I mean, the ones that we we've had previously. Basically, we've got about we've got about thirty of them. We're announcing, you know, every couple of days over the next uh, month or so. So, I, I, all of those are sort of under embargo. So, there's a range from digitals, NFTs. Uh, we've also got some big brands and some really big platforms um, integrating as well. But previously, um, on 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 V1, we've had Tommy Hilfiger, Hogan. The you know the Rab Rebels, Fang Gang, um, Auroboros. So lots of you know a, a range between um, you know kind of Web three um, and sort of digital, digital fashion, and then all the way across to, to sort of Web two. We're also we've also got jewel, lots of jewelry. Um, this luxury wines and spirits is a massive one because yeah, yeah I mean you, you know it, it really reason. fits well yeah. with financializing. Um, so yeah, really quite a, quite quite a, a, a broad range, yeah. So let's spin out a scenario here. I'm a I'm a YouTuber. I decide I want to launch a range of comfy pants for the masses, and uh, I want to start shipping them. Is that a suitable application yeah. for Boson? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you can use Boson to do that. You could work with one of one of our partners uh, if you wanted. You know. Um, to have a more sort of self hand you know managed service where they might help you with the website they might help do the fulfillment etc um and then you know you not you could not just only sell things but let's say you issued your own nft or let's say that you wanted to create some sort of loyalty program where your best uh most loyal in a circle maybe you know they got you know some special variety of of, of this merch etc then you could issue them with like a special NFT that would then be token gated. Um, you know, you could you could create an NFT that was wearable in Decentraland, etc., and then would, would would also act as you know an unlock for merch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But literally, all you would have to do once, um, well, right now, if you contact us, we will um, help you set up a, 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 a decentralized storefront. Um, for um when we launch it in a month um and so yeah you you would have your own storefront completely free uh boson charges 0.5 percent protocol fee for all transactions and then you would be able to sell these physical things as as nfts uh, via boson yeah well that's a lot better than two and a half percent from OpenSea. so already that's very attractive um well listen yeah. justin I, I my next guest is ready to, ready to rock and roll with this but uh, thanks so much for taking the time i really i think you're onto something and i think you know that already i can see it in your eyes you know like this is this is going to go big
But I think we had like, a vision and it's coming to pass. So we're yeah, just enjoying it. And it's literally every single item in the world could be sent through Boson. It's very exciting. Well, listen, thanks so much for joining us. Um, thanks, Robin. We are about to be joined by Dan Sickles, the director behind newhere.xyz. Uh, but first, we must hear from our sponsors. Do you think that Bitcoin will be higher than $20,000 in the next 30 days? Bet on it on Logium.org, the first P2P DeFi betting protocol. Go to app.logium.org, connect your wallet, choose the token that you want to bet on, pick a bet that interests you from the list, click Take Bet button, and done. You can track your earnings on the portfolio page, and it's so simple. Take your first bet on Logium. Galaxy is the leading Web3 credential data network in the world. This collaborative credential infrastructure enables brands and developers to engage communities and build robust products in Web3. With Galaxy, users can explore Web3 and learn to earn campaigns with over 700 partners. On the other hand, builders have the opportunity to create growth campaigns on a seamless plug-and-play dashboard. Galaxy is constantly innovating, introducing Galaxy Passport, the one-click solution to verifying Web3 identities. Mint yours today. Welcome back. Welcome back. Dan Sickles is on the stream. We can't hear yo, you, Dan. Yo. There can he you, is. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. I can hear you now. I can hear you now. How are you, sir? I'm bringing... I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. The streets of New York to your studio. It turns out oh. that the office next to my office had a leak, so, so we're outside today. Oh my god! Well, that's fresh. At least you got sunshine there. We, it's been pissing down in the rain here for the last god knows how many weeks. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, nice. So good to see you. Good to see you too. Listen, we must talk about the film. I mean, there's so much to dig into with this this entire project. But yeah, sure. um, I'll tell you what. Let's go back and talk about you. Give give the people at home a little sense of who you are where you come from and, and your journey to get here because you've done some stuff, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a nonfiction filmmaker, maker by trade. Uh, I, I've been working in, in that, in the, the industry, I'd say for, for over a decade now, making independent film, um, largely in the nonfiction genre. Uh, you know, I, I guess I made my first feature film. I started production in that in about 2010. Uh, that film's called Mala Mala, and it took me about three and a half years to make. Uh, it documents the trans liberation movement uh, that was occurring in Puerto Rico at the time. Um, that film premiered in theaters in 2014 um, after after premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's the Tribeca bit that, that really kind of made me sit up and take notice because not not many films get into Tribeca. It's kind of like Sundance, but on the East Coast. So it's yeah, know, for sure. No, thing. it was it was like a huge honor. Like I mean, it was it was wild, and and that was my first uh, you know film and first like premiere experience and like we were able to bring all of the cast from puerto rico to come which was wild uh we we put together an incredible drag show um and yeah it was it was it was an experience uh, for sure and you know i went from that then to making my second film basically straight from mala mala into making a film called dina um which came out in theaters in 2017 uh after premiering at the sundance film festival um and we won the grand jury tick, prize at sundance tick yeah so like if uh, yeah. you don't know if you don't know what what dan has done here is he's basically he's he's he, he did it like if you're a young aspiring <laughs> filmmaker and you're you're in the independent <laughs> film business sundance like everybody wants to be in sundance and there are more films submitted to sundance than any other film festival in the world it's that competitive so you get in there yeah you you did it you did a great job but to win a, a grand jury prize i mean that's serious yeah no it must i mean have been for a great me moment. It was it was ridiculous, honestly. I mean, like I think the speech is still online somewhere, and every now and then someone finds it and then they hit me up about it because I think I got I got up and I and I remember just making some sort of comment about like like peeing my pants in front of everybody, like <laughs> just how nervous I was to actually just be standing up there because I remember like Gael Garcia Bernal was there and like Peter Dinklage was sitting in the front row and like like really like incredibly incredibly talented people that like I've just admired for so long and like all of a sudden like. I'm just holding some award uh, and they're looking at me and I'm like, what am I supposed to say? Because to be uh, to be real, I mean, like that film, Dina was made entirely independently, uh, you know, put together by financing from people that I knew. You know, we, we got the, the last money together basically when that film was was basically at a rough cut. Um, it was a, it was a slog to get that film together because it's a film that really rides on the shoulders of 
of a middle-aged woman on the spectrum in suburban Philadelphia um, who isn't famous. Sell it. You know, you just, and, just sell it, man. You, I can imagine the pitches for that. So it's a middle-aged woman. Oh. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, it, was, it was wild. It was yeah. wild. And, I, you know, I mean, whatever. It's, I, I, I've also sort of become very comfortable in those situations, in those rooms, right, where, yeah. where like, you're like, hey, I have this idea, and you see it in their face. They're like, I understand 10% of what this guy's talking about or or what this could be or whatever. And, you know, I, I, 90% of the time now I'm realizing that it's it's really just my job to really throw my hat over the fence and figure out a way to just get it made. Uh, you know, especially in situations like this, especially with with a film like with this one too. Um, yeah, and I, I think what a lot of people don't understand because YouTubers have made it appear that filmmaking is easy, and I think you can you can content create at a very low cost at a very high frequency with relative ease. But filmmaking, particularly documentary filmmaking, like I don't know what your ratio in your edits was, but usually you like you throw away most of what you shoot. It doesn't it doesn't even end up yeah. in the film. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I think the first two trips to Puerto Rico, I feel like we spent like a month there filming. And like, I don't think any of that footage is in the final film, uh, mostly because that was us just even figuring out what that film was. Um, same with Dina. I mean, Dina, if, if you watch that film, uh, it's, it's pretty seamless. It plays like a narrative film. It plays like a rom-com. Um, but it was a very, very tedious process and like a very tedious film to make. Um, and I guess like, you know, I, I guess that there are maybe easy films. Uh, there are films that have been easy to make. Um, for me, I, I think that like, I, I always, I always want to give my film legs, you know, I, I want to create media that, that lasts. I want to create uh, films that are cinematic and like can be looked at 10 years after they come out and still have some sort of relevance to the present moment. Um, and that I think is really what takes time. You know, it takes a lot of listening and a lot of studying and a lot of writing and rewriting, and editing, and re-editing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like that, that's that's largely my process for how I attack this work. Yeah. I mean, I, when people hear about screenwriters, they think the screenwriter writes the script and then that gets shot and then it gets edited according to the script and then that's it. And what they don't realize is that there's there's a director that has several heart attacks because they know that the film doesn't work. And then they give it to their editor and their editor goes, I think we can fix this. And then they spend <clears throat> pretty much all day, every day, over caffeinated fixing stuff because you don't know what it's going to be. And also the thing is, if you are, if you're creating a film, you rarely get enough time to really figure it out and to do like in the old days, they did screen oh, tests, yeah. you'd, you know, you'd have people together, you figure it out on set. And the first two weeks, you're terrible. You're oh, terrible. For sure. And so, For like, sure. you know, you, you edit, and then you do reshoots, and everyone's like, "Why are you reshooting?" It's like because it sucked. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that that sort of is also that's affected the way that I approach filming now too. You know, I think for for new here for this film that I'm working on now, you know, I'm I'm right now working on a sequence uh, in Tyler Hobbs's studio. Um, he, he's working on Incomplete Control, uh, which is actually the the drop that he had before QQL actually yesterday. Um, oh my God, QQL. Dude, are you kidding me? Like, on a light, and then and then that same that uh, twenty four hours later, a punk sells for thirty three hundred ETH. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, NFTs are dead. Oh, NFTs are dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dead, 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 dead. Like totally. what? Yeah, but working with Tyler, I mean, like attack, like sort of attacking that scene and like looking at it. I mean, you know, I, I very intentionally shot it in ways that make that scene flexible, right? Yeah. Um, and, and like, you know, there, there are so many different ways of doing that, but, you know, looking at where it's going to fit into the overall edit, it's like, I now know like the three different ways that can play in the film. And all, and all of that is going to be a different edit and it's going to be braided in differently depending on where it lands, because it's kind of like, you know, with, with the, with the doc, you're just kind of putting a puzzle together and seeing what the, what the pieces are first before you can even make them click. I know. I think that's, that's, that's sort of what's so difficult for, for anyone who does it hasn't made a documentary to understand that you, you what you're making is not the truth it's a fiction in the same way that anything is a fiction but it's just grounded in you know real people's lives and real people's stories it's yeah, amazing it's what honest. you do in the edit yeah sometimes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. But, not, but not the truth i mean i yeah I like, to, I like to think that i'm making very honest work um but yeah no it's, it's definitely not like any sort of objective yeah truth. no i i, I, I don't I, make I that, that thing yeah. yeah for sure um, um 
so yeah let's well let's talk about you here so we we know now that you're a hellaciously good filmmaker and anyone who can actually make this a career particularly in niche indie documentaries like you have i mean you must be good at it so now we find our way into nft the nft space like what was your journey into this how did you get excited about it uh to be honest uh you know it was it was through being disappointed i guess through like working in film in like the the traditional landscape like uh the way in which films are born nowadays um it's it's even harder than i think it was 10 years ago uh because everything is really geared towards streamers um and sort of like what what will appear to you know the, the three or four players that, that are still you know that still have money uh basically in, in the industry yeah. uh so it, it kind of like it homogenizes like a lot of a lot of the ideas that are going on right now i mean you, you see it in in what's being produced i mean like there's two documentaries about the fire festival we don't even know how many jeffrey dahmer films and series there are <laughs> right. out right now yeah. um so so it makes it extraordinarily difficult to, to pitch anything novel or new and you know i i i did break through uh actually that and and i was working with a streamer um i i actually had pitched a series that i was directing i had developed i was writing and producing all of it um and it was uh, one of like the the most empowering experiences of my entire life to be honest uh and and sort of like the the work relationship just wasn't healthy at all um and that, that was a project that unfortunately i had to leave um and around that time was really when i started learning about web3 um and and crypto art and nfts and i mean really crypto in general and sort of like looking under the hood to a place that i left in 2017 like i got into crypto then but then like left during the bear and didn't really sell because i was like well i'm down so bad i, I may as well just like leave it there right but then came back to it and started looking under the hood and it was like whoa like there is crazy culture happening here being created um by like some wild artists i mean like you like look at rare pepes and like it's like it's fun you know um and it was sort of like this rediscovery of the internet for me um and sort of reinvention of like the idea of online communities um for me and you know it, it hit me at the right time for sure and and i saw what a lot of artists were talking about in terms of ownership um and and how they were feeling empowered in this space to to make work um but also the way in which they could distribute it and for me you know sort of coming off the back of that um i was like this is this is it like this is this this is inevitable for sure um and if if i'm gonna like spend a lot of time you know like learning more and more about it diving deeper and deeper into it then i may as well try and do what i know how to do uh better than trade nfts right and that let's make a film um about why this is relevant what's going on here um and that's the project that we really started about 16 months ago called new here so this is new here and i and i totally understand what you're saying here because i, I did the same thing like your instinctive kind of research brain kicks in and then mm. it becomes a story and it, you become fascinated by the story which is why me having a chance to talk to people on these streams and and hear their stories is it's just so edifying but tell me about the process because i know it hasn't been straightforward figuring out how you do a project like this and you're not the first film that has had nfts connected but i think the way you're doing it and how you've got here can tell other projects that might be thinking about this a lot yeah for sure you know um again we knew that we wanted to make this film about a year and a half ago uh and for me uh i i I very intentionally make every effort to make make films uh, of the subject matter that I'm working with, not just like films that are talking at them or, or just like pointing at them and saying, this is what this is, right? Um, so, you know, everything from putting my team together, I mean, my producers, I have an entirely crypto native team um, from my producers to like the VFX and digital animators. Um, but we wanted to do that for the fundraising too. And we, <laughs> We spent months uh, figuring out how to actually offer uh, true securities um, in, in fundraising for this film. And uh, like literally hours with multiple lawyers, uh, tens of thousands of dollars. I think like on the very practical level, like about a $1.2 million raise, like would end up costing around $100,000 just in terms of, of like logistic costs. 
Um, so, so it became like such a, a burden and, and such a heavy lift in the process of trying to get it started um, that, that we ultimately had to like let it lie. You know, like we know very much what the problems are. We know what the obstacles are in making something like that happen and seamless in the future. Yeah. Um, so it is something that we're looking to attack uh, down the line. But, you know, in, but the, regu in the regulation, of, the, the regulation just isn't there. There's no clarity and there's also there's no secondary market for any of that stuff anyway. So it's completely illiquid. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So like and if you're in a situation like where you can afford to like hire a great team of lawyers to stand up to the SEC, then like more power to you. And like there are people in this space that are like are, are sort of like looking to have that conversation in a very active way. And like I'm talking to them for sure. But I, I'm trying to make a film, you know, like it's like I'm trying to like square yeah. one, like make the film that explains to whatever, even like SEC regulators, why the space is relevant at all, you know, and, and like that, I think, happens in, in the form of a story best. Um, so that that's why we were like, OK, the securities thing, it can hang here for, for the moment. And like we'll get back to that. We, we will tackle that eventually. Like the tech is there. The, the will is there for sure. Um, how, much, how much time did you spend going down that dead end? Oh, we spent uh, the better part of, I would say, 10, 10 months, 10, 11 oh months. Oh, my gosh. So you started oh, yeah. in the middle of a bull market when everything was exciting and wow, and, and it took you all the way out of that bull market, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we could definitely frame it like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we, that's, that's exactly what we were doing. Um, you just wanted to max paint it. That's fine, man. You know, you're a filmmaker. And, it's it's the it's the starving I mean, artist and, thing, and isn't it? Nonfiction filmmaker, like literally trying to put together this film that that involves like over a hundred artists uh, and and thinkers and so much in travel. Space. So I guess I am a bit of a masochist when it comes to it. But yeah, man. Um, no, I guess I I'm, I'm very process oriented, you know, and and I think that like that in the in the, at the start was was the novel thing. Like I wanted to be able to say to people at the start like you can be a profit participant in this film and and even if you have 30 bucks like even if you have ten dollars like that, that's all good like you, you can come in there be part of the community and do this with us um yeah we know sort of all the obstacles that are that are there and like that that's a whole other conversation but in that time then we pivoted um and we came up with this dope drop um that really really celebrates the cast uh of this film and and the people making it with us uh so, and yeah tell, tell me tell me about the, the the drop and how it's all all put together because yeah. you've got some interesting things going on here yeah for sure so basically we we've made uh pixelated avatars of our entire cast um and we're taking all of their traits there's over a thousand traits and we're we're actually adding i think about 65 more uh because of the orders that came in at the last minute a few days ago um but we're taking all of those traits and generating a 10,000 avatar collection um, using these. So basically, like, you know, you, you can get like Joy World's head uh, with Coldy's 3D glasses and Tyler Hobbs's body with like Snowfro's chromy squiggle. Um, and we just think it's like a dope way of actually celebrating, again, like the, the diversity, the spectrum, uh, the, the vibrancy within the space. And this um, is a great, this is a great selection of people here as well. This is like the who's who roll call of literally, you know, it's because covers a lot of different viewpoints. I don't think all these people necessarily agree with each other as well, but this, they is, don't. this is awesome. <laughs> and no, they don't. That's actually something that lives in the film and like part of like putting this oral history together that, I, that I'm really excited for people to see because like, you know, it, it isn't monolithic in here at all. And there, there are lots of conversations happening uh, inside of it for sure. Um, now the, the the biggest the biggest problem that any documentary filmmaker has is what's my ending, and I know that you've probably sat there and thought, <laughs> well, how the fuck do I finish the thing? Because the NFT space is always evolving. I made a film in two weeks, which was an hour and a half long, and it was just me just I've seen collecting it. all the stuff that I did. I was like, even during it's the course film. of making that, I was just like, there is no way for me to finish this film unless I just finish it. I have to stop because you just keep going. And keep going. And go. So, do you know what your ending is? And you, you can say no, but I'm I'm curious if you know. I have I have a very deep sense of what yeah the the end shot is for sure. Um, I I know I, I know in terms of the thesis. I know in terms of like the themes. Sort of what my 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 biggest question is right now. 
Yeah. Um, and it's it's kind of the eternal one that's being asked in this space, and it's very much related to the relationship between art and money. Um, how how so when airdrop? How we reconcile these things? When airdrop? When, when Lambo? Airdrop. Um, yeah, you know, basically everybody who buys one of these NFTs from New Here will be will be receiving a Lambo in due time. You heard it here, folks. Folks, Quote Lambos for everyone. <laughs> Lambos for you. Lambos for you. I don't get a Lambo. Um, <laughs> but no, that's yeah, awesome. you know, one thing. One thing too that I like to point out is like fifteen percent of this drop, uh, the the gross revenue in perpetuity is actually going to the cast involved in it. Um, so we have all of their wallets. Uh, we are automating it as, as we get all those wallets in, because uh, again, managing all those conversations is, is a bit complicated. Um, but you know, that's that's part of the the beauty of this tech is that like we can actually sort of build that into the contract. So as this project does well, yeah. you know, the entire ecosystem of this project is lifted. I know, and isn't it isn't it just so frustrating that? As a filmmaker or a creative or an artist, or any other thing, you, you always have to apply for funding. And it's always this excruciatingly long-winded process whereby you fall out of love with your own project because you've oh just God, had yeah. to pitch it to so many people so many times. And then we have this, these barriers in the way, which is, oh, no, this is a security and therefore you cannot do it. And it's like, yes. why are we making it so hard for people to share in the creation of things that are really kind of valuable? Because for sure, I don't think I don't think anybody knows how to value them. That's the problem. So it's it's always this kind of, what is the value of art? Where do we place this value in in the context of everything? Um, and it, like it's you know, it's it's a really really tough question. And someone, Big Ed from me, has just literally put a question out. So this NFT drop is crowdfunding for a movie. I don't think that's entirely correct, right? It's not just crowdfunding for a movie. You're actually trying to reinvent movies on the blockchain. I mean, there, there's that's that's actually definitely part of what we're doing. The the initial drop, all of that will be going towards funding the rest of this film. So again, the priority is funding the film. Um, parallel to that, though, we are creating an archive uh, that's going to store basically all of this footage. Um, something that that we've spoken on actually is, you know, like the work is to make a singular film right now, um, and we've shot over two hundred hours uh, with different people in the space, right? Um, something I like talking about is actually, I just got a cut down of um, just the story of Rare Pepe's um, a few weeks ago. And in my mind, I was like, okay, cool. This is going to be a solid 40 minutes, including everybody that, that I've spoken to Rare Pepe's about. And, uh, and it'll be really solid. And I, I get the download and, and it's an hour and 40 minutes long. Um, just with, you know, I, I'm using probably two dozen voices in the space to, to just talk about the Rare Pepe story. Um, and that's that's something that I would like to live somewhere. And then again, using this tech, we, we can actually make that happen. So parallel to the film, we are actually building an archive um, that is going to be interoperable within several different metaverses and also accessible online, just, just by virtue of a, a website. Uh, and you'll be able to check everything out there. Um, as things continue, you know, depending on how this drop goes, uh, what we what we plan to do is actually directly attack sort of how we can make crowdfunding for collaborative arts projects in that way more accessible, more seamless using this technology. Because it's all there. Uh, we, we really just actually need to power our lawyers on a bit more um, to, to figure out sort of the, the granular details of how we can make that happen. So there's a lot going on. I mean, like, like any sort of NFT project, it, it's very, it's very icebergy. Um, and sort of the tip of it is actually creating this film. Um, which again is, is a film that is really working to speak to people who aren't in this space, who don't already speak this language, um, who don't know anything about NFTs and really work to demystify it and make it less scary for them uh, to enter it. Yeah, big mission. But I think it's there's there's probably something for everybody in this space if they can get past the for sure the kind of the toxic debates and the the wrong turns and everything else. You know, it's funny talking to Justin before. About how any yeah. item can be given a digital twin that's an NFT and then easily sold, <clears throat> traded, and you're just taking commerce and removing Amazon from that equation. You know, here we're taking filmmaking and culture, culture and art, and removing platforms from the equation. And you know, who doesn't want that? Oh yeah, the platforms. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think that that's something that I mean, you and I, I think, uh, pretty personally, are, are, are pretty excited about. 
you know, how we can sort of like liberate the creation of, of culture. Uh, and I think that we, you know, we have a few ideas as to how to make that happen. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm people in the chat have been wondering why I said this is my last stream ever. And I'm also obsessed with the same things that you are attacking it from a different angle, attacking the audience piece. Because I think if you if you get the audience bit right, then the rest of it becomes exponentially easier. But <clears throat> yes, there, this is my last stream ever for The Defiant. And you were my last guest ever for The Defiant. Wow. I couldn't think of a better one. So Dan, thanks so much. And if you haven't uh, checked in on the new here drop, it's newhere.xyz. And if you want to support a Sundance winning filmmaker making a film that will by, I mean, it's, I have no doubt will be the textbook go to for what this space genuinely truly is, is about, then go help them out and you help, help get it made. Cause that's Robin, what we do. Here. We support our own. We support our own. So listen, um, Dan, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone on the comments. Congratulations. Do check in at 10 PM central Eastern time this evening, where I will tell you the people what I'm actually up to, but until then for the final time, this is it. I'm out of here. Thanks, Dan. Peace. Thank you, Robin. Thank you.